Welcome everyone to our Just Energy for All webinar, unveiling the equity and justice dimensions uh, of the climate energy water nexus. We're really happy to have you all here. Uh, my name is Ilka Vega. I'm the executive for economic and environmental justice with United Women in Faith. Um, and today I'm joining you from the Mayan indigenous lands of Chetumal, beautiful paradise full of water. So very appropriate for uh, this topic in this conversation. To get us started, um, I would like to um, introduce uh, Ms. Maybelline uh, Strong. Um, she is a native um, of Louisiana and a graduate of Louisiana Tech University. And Ms. Maybelline will be opening us in prayer today. Um, so I'll share a little bit about her. Uh, she received an associate degree in business administration and a bachelor's degree in liberal arts from the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. And she serves now as the first black president of United Women in Faith for the Arkansas Conference. And she's a member of Hunter United Methodist Church in Little Rock. She has had many roles within United Women in Faith. So we're really blessed to have her and her church as well. And she currently serves also as a Mission U youth assistant teacher. She's married to uh, Mr. Elston Strong, and they have two boys and four grandchildren. She's passionate about improving the lives of all women, children, and youth. And we're really thankful to have you as part of United Women in Faith and opening us in prayer today. Thank you, Ms. Mason. Thank you. I'm so excited and very happy and honored to bring the prayer to you today. Please bow your heads for prayer. Our Father, our God, our Creator, thanks be to you for bringing us together today for Just Energy for All webinar. Heavenly Father, we meet you with thanksgiving. Forgiving God, we confess the poverty of our spirits. Hear our heartfelt cry. We lift up to you our broken hearts as we hear of the news around the world about the Israel-Hamas war that involves so many innocent women, so many innocent children, men, and families. We pray for those who are suffering unspeakable abuse. Lord Jesus, send your spirit into the hearts of all men so that the world might know true peace through your abundant mercy. Our world is so full of war and strife with one conflicting arising after another. We turn to you, dear Lord, to change this situation. Jesus, we ask that you send your spirit into the hearts of all men so that the world might know true peace through your abundant mercy. Lord, we are calling out to you right now to put an end to the shedding of innocent blood around the world. Hear our cry, dear Lord, because you are a God of peace. We know that through you, we are never, ever without hope. We ask that you intervene in the horrors of war and let peace rule in all lands. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Maybelline. Now I'll give you a quick um, overview for um, our agenda for today. Um, I'll do a quick introduction uh, to our webinar topic and then we'll have um, Jessica Jewell from uh, the Water Hub and Climate Nexus. Um, and we'll have uh, Ben Murray um, as well uh, from the Water, um, water and uh ah, and was that what food and water watch um and then we'll have a few a q a with where you can bring your questions uh, we invite you to also write them in the chat um so that we can capture them and ask our speakers at the end of their presentations and then we'll have our announcements and next steps um at the end so i'll do i'll walk us a little bit um into this uh conversation of the water climate water energy nexus or whatever order <laughs> you want to do um what it's important about uh talking about climate and energy and water is that we are want to highlight how these systems are interconnected um and their relationship 
um, in the physical world, in the policy world, uh, and how they impact our lives, right? We saw that a lot of our communities experience these challenges across these different systems and topics, um, and they're very much um, interconnected, and we can see it that changes in one system can have significant impacts on the other. So for instance, uh, climate change, we know, um, can affect our energy and water supplies. We saw it in Texas when the, we had um, the winter storms in 2021 and we lost power all across the state. Um, definitely uh, impacts water patterns. So our water supplies are also affected and, and we've seen it, right? Rising temperatures, changing precipitation patterns. There's a lot of um, impact that climate change has. Extreme weather events, droughts, for example, can also reduce the availability for um, power generation, such as um, hydropower, for instance, or the cooling um, uh, needed in thermal power plants, um, among other impacts. And likewise, energy production and consumption as well. Um, we know we talk about it often in our webinar, and depending on the type of energy, particularly fossil fuels, contribute to climate change through emissions, right, Green, of greenhouse gases, which can exacerbate the impacts of climate change temperatures rise and that also influences um, again impacts on water um, and, and weather patterns and water resources also um, as i mentioned already that are used for energy production particularly in sectors such as hydropower thermoelectric power generation um, and other cooling processes that different um, energy production processes uh, involve um, so it's, it's very key um, connecting uh, these conversations, right? Um, because they're they're highly, highly interconnected, right? Like water sources, obviously we use them to drink, but we have also food uh, systems that depend on these resources, also in weather patterns, also in, in water uh, resources. And so it's important um, that, that we consider them together. Um, and we can also see that they, they even expand to more nexuses and more connections, right? Uh, we can add issues of land management, of housing, food production, as I said, um, that are also closely to, uh, connected to this nexus, this climate, water, um, and energy nexus um, that are essential for our surviving. And what's important for us as people of faith, people working uh, for justice is that um, these systems also disproportionately impact um, those with higher vulnerabilities, those that have been historically marginalized. We know that people of color, older adults, um, children, women, people with disabilities also have sometimes higher impacts um, to energy burden, to water scarcity, um, to higher climate vulnerability, right? Um, we see that people of color have 19% um, in the U.S. more and experience more energy burden um, than the national average uh, of 4 percent. So it's um, certainly the disproportionate impacts um, of our energy system. Um, you know, people of color also were also more likely to face challenges of accessing affordable and drinking water. Um, we see it all across the states from the colonias in South Texas, uh, where we were just a few days ago, uh, close to Flint and all over the U.S. Um, and certainly the climate vulnerability um, of our cities, is, as Ruth was saying, we're all vulnerable to climate uh, change impacts to the climate crisis, but certainly some communities that have been underfunded have a much harder time recovering with disasters to occur, right? Um, so definitely we see the disproportionate effects there. And when it comes to stewardship, we as people of faith, um, these are key systems to pay attention to. Um, so I wanted to share with you also um, just a quick um, quote uh, from our book of resolutions, which makes different recommendations to how we're meant to carry out our global climate stewardship. Um, thank you, Keisha, for sharing that um, on the screen. So it, tell, it takes, talks about our responsibility for global climate stewardship um, but we also have in that book very specific recommendations for equitable and renewable energy production that we want uh, to promote um, and the impacts um, that it has on water. So one example that it talks about and making these connections as well, as we know, is the use of water, for instance, for fossil fuel extraction. Um, and we know this process as, as fracking. So it says um, hydraulic fracturing 
which is what we call fracking, has opened vast new deposits of oil and gas for exploration, but with serious consequences for communities, water quality and geological stability. Deep sea water extraction presents consequences and risks that we do not yet fully understand, including destruction of aquatic ecosystems and pollution from leaks and spills. The burning of fossil fuels causes large scale pollution and seriously alters the environment by increasing the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere contributing to climate change. So we see it there in one paragraph already, very concise, that connection um, between energy production, water, and climate change. And so it's important uh, to make these connections um, within our system at the, and at the policy level, right? Because we want to um, make sure that we're not working in silos, uh, but that we really understand uh, how we said before, it's changes in one system impact on the others as well, right? And that we understand the connections uh, of how they impact our communities and especially vulnerable and underfunded, historically underfunded communities. So to take us deeper into this conversation, I would actually uh, like to invite our first speaker, uh, Jessica Jewell. Uh, uh, Ms. Sara uh, Bucci, which was the strat uh, strategic communication specialist with the Water Hub um, at Climate Change Nexus, was unfortunately not able to join us today um, due to a family emergency, but her colleague, uh, Jessica, um, who is the director of digital strategy um, also at Climate Nexus uh, Water, um, Water Hub is presenting on her behalf. Uh, so I'll introduce um, Jessica. Um, so she Jessica has over 10 years of marketing and communications experience to support water justice. She works to build narratives and powerful storytelling for equitable policymaking, fighting historic underinvestment and environmental racism and connecting the dots between food and climate, protecting wildlands and how rainwater harvest is a win-win. Jessica is passionate about social justice and has an extensive career in creating opportunities for young people. Uh, she formerly uh, worked at Connect to Pod, an organization uh, empowering marginalized youth with the skills to tell their own stories through podcasting. Um, and also she worked at the National Institutes of Health program dedicated to increasing diversity in STEM uh, for um, body scientists. So thank you, Jessica, for joining us today. And we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much for the warm introduction. I'm happy to be with y'all. Uh, thank you for having me in uh, Sarah's absence. I'll do my best to do uh, this justice. And I'm very excited to chat. Uh, today we're going to be, again, I'll be covering how to communicate about the climate, water, and energy justice nexus. So uh, happy to take you through if you want to head over to the next slide. Thank you. So uh, again, thank you for the warm welcome. You already heard a little bit about me, but uh, my name is Jessica Jewell. I use she, her pronouns. I'm based out of just outside of Los Angeles on uh, Tongva land. And I'm the digital director at the Water Hub at Climate Nexus. Uh, to give you a little bit of context of what we do at the Water Hub, so we're essentially a pro bono comms and digital shop supporting uh, the water justice movement. And we do this through story-based strategies and narrative change to advance climate and water justice. Uh, so our work, I just wanted to clarify that, you know, I'm coming at this through the lens of being a communicator uh, that works on water issues. So I wanted to tell you a little bit more about our focus. Uh, we believe that stories shape systems, and in order to advance environmental justice, we have to shift the narrative to build power and change policy, right? So people care deeply about water. That includes having safe water to drink, and protecting their favorite waterways like rivers, lakes, and streams. But public awareness could benefit from clearer communications and engagement. And we believe that a more equitable and inclusive movement will lead to more effectiveness and lead to better water management. And that's true across all environmental justice issues. 
So uh, a few points of focus of our work at the Water Hub is we work to expand access to safe and affordable drinking water. Uh, we work with groups, you know, from the Great Lakes to the Gulf South to advance this, uh, for example, on um, low income water affordability policy, for example. We also work on highlighting the climate and water related risks um, and opportunities. So, for example, we do a lot of pitching around the Colorado River Basin or other impacted watersheds and communities um, as it pertains to climate change. And uh, lastly, one of our other focuses at the Water Hub is shifting our relationship to water. And we do that through both arts and culture. Sometimes that means partnering with an artist or influencers or uh, musicians even to communicate around water through the heart and through culture. Uh, next slide, please. Great. So every year we conduct an annual voter survey to better understand the concerns and support for different water justice issues in different communities and among voters. So some relevant findings at the intersection of water, climate, and energy from our most recent survey re we released in August include, as you might see on the screen here, um, that most voters at 68% actually say that drinking water and sewage infrastructure should be the top priority for um, the US government in terms of infrastructure spending. That's followed by renewable energy at 59%, and um, then of the electricity grid at 56%, which also rose to the top of the list. Uh, we also learned that 58% of voters are concerned about the impact of climate change on drinking water safety. And 74%, uh, that's a large majority of folks who do support the banning of water shutoffs, speaking to what I was saying previously around water access affordability. So this is a, water is a winner. We see uh, bipartisan support for folks that do care about uh, water access and ending water shutoffs for folks that are behind or can't afford their water bills. Uh, and then lastly, uh, what I'll say in terms of this slide is that a PFAS chemical contamination of water supplies, and just to break that down if you don't know, but PFAS are a group of um, chemicals that are called forever chemicals because our body can't really ever metabolize and process them out of our, um, our systems. And they have long reaching effects from reproductive issues to higher rates of cancer and other um, multi-system impacts whenever we're ingesting a lot of it. And they tend to be in cosmetics and in, in uh, cleaning chemicals, even sometimes food packaging, like our pizza delivery boxes with those waxy surfaces. But that said, I just wanted to say that this is an emerging issue that's gaining more awareness and attention. And 75% of voters support stopping the use of PFAS chemicals in household products. 82% support an EPA rule to limit some PFAS chemicals in drinking water, and voters agree that PFAS in their products at 44% and PFAS manufacturers at 30% are most responsible for the cost of cleanup of these um, forever chemicals. Uh, next slide. Thanks. Great. So um, when we talk about the intersection of climate, water, and energy, I like to lead with the fact that water is a winner. And while concern about the water or the climate crisis is growing, and we'll get that to the next slide, um, it's still polarized, right? So yet, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll just wrap this up. It's okay, you can stay there, it's fine. Uh, yet for more than 20 years, water issues um, poll as the top environmental concern year over year. There's a smaller gap in concern and support for folks with different political affiliations now, we're uh, closing that a gap and finding more common ground, especially as it pertains to water. Um, making this easier to talk about the impact um, as issues for water is a great place to start to find common ground with folks. And I just wanna flag that 
There are some links that I will be dropping in the chat um, that pertain to some of these um, points that I'm making throughout the presentation. So uh, prepare for those, but for now I'll keep chatting. So, right, so here we are. So one thing I've mentioned that gives me hope is how climate concern is increasing across um, political affiliation. And so um, the Yale Climate Communications Program has been measuring public opinion on climate change for 20 years and is now finding today that uh, the majority of Americans are actually concerned or alarmed about climate change and those groups are growing. Next slide. And so you'll see, you know, headlines pop up here on this slide as I talk through, but the way people often experience climate change is through weather and water. Um, and if you keep, yes, exactly, thank you. This provides an opportunity for us to talk to folks about issues they care about and how climate solutions will protect their communities, their waterways, and their drinking water to get really specific about what they care about and tapping into their values. So um, this is a conversation about climate, water, and energy justice and why we're all here today. And like you know, was mentioned at the top before I kicked this off myself, uh, Black, Indigenous, and other communities of color bear the brunt of pollution and extracting and burning of fossil fuels, water insecurity, and climate disasters. So whether it's contaminated drinking water, aging infrastructure, or flooding and fire, we need to follow the leadership of the folks most impacted by the problem and work toward long-term sustainable solutions. But there's good news. There are multi-benefit solutions that can help solve climate. Oh, sorry, can you hear me? Okay, that can hear, um, solve climate and water um, problems at once. So walking through a couple examples, for example, in the West, Conserving water is an important strategy to conserve energy as well, uh, because it takes a lot of power to heat, treat, and move water around. And in places that experience stormwater flooding or urban heat islands, swapping pavement for plants through parks, rain gardens, bioswales, and more addresses both issues at once while providing folks with more green space. So it's a win, win, win. We can protect people from heat. We can protect people from flooding. We can store water in the ground for drier days through these beautiful solutions that offer more space for people to enjoy. Uh, another example of um, a multi-win strategy is looking to regenerative agricultural practices that are water smart and that also keep more greenhouse grasses in the soil and use less fossil fuels and pesticides to farm for healthier food and um, more stable climate. Voters agree and support equitable distribution of resources too. Our last poll that, um, last year actually found a strong majority of voters say that the government should prioritize communities with the greatest need. That's 59% of folks that we polled. Uh, when considering how to allocate infrastructure spending rather than just distributing it equally across the board, which 41% of folks said that that's how it should be um, approached. And one note I'll add um, is that we found that describing the risks or impacts communities are experiencing makes voters more likely to say that they should be prioritized rather than focusing on race or relying on movement terms like frontline communities or disadvantaged communities. So instead getting really specific in what you're communicating, like for example, communities that are still experiencing um, exposure, like dangerous exposure to high levels of lead because of the pipes that they're drinking their water from, or you know, messaging around how you know, some families in Flint, for example, or Detroit are um, experiencing difficulties with keeping up with their water bills or just getting really clear about what the story is instead of just using a blanket kind of vague term like frontline group. And um, next slide, please. And since, you know, the Water Hub, we're a comms organization, I'll end my presentation with a call to action to break down the silos 
between different areas of environmental justice, like we're introduced at the top, how this is a multi-system, uh, multi-faceted um, problem. We have um, issues of climate, energy, and water that often get talked about separately, yet they are all interconnected. And that works in our favor because we can tell stories of progress and possibility and solutions, like I said, that solve multiple problems at once. So this helps us speak to people's hearts as well as their heads. And telling stories about the impacts and crisis, for example, can help us build a sense of urgency while telling stories of progress nurtures hope. But we need both urgency and hope as vital ingredients to help inspire action. We can't get stuck in the nihilism and the doomism. We also need to you know, be mindful of being clear that there are um, impacts that are happening right now and to call attention to that. Um, so that, that's, that kind of wraps up my uh, presentation. Please feel free to stay in touch with us or ask questions, sign up for our newsletter here. And I'm going to follow up and drop some links in the chat like I said I would. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jessica, for that presentation and giving us some tips on how to use the power of our storytelling to tell these stories and getting specific um, about the issues that are happening in order to get more people together. And I love what you said about the win-win situation. We could have wins on climate, energy, and water. Uh, it's truly possible if we if we connect to those, connect the systems and the advocacy and efforts that we're doing. Um, so I appreciate um, those and, and taking a lot of notes as well for us and how we're communicating on these issues um, moving forward. Um, I would like to invite now um, a band to um, give us the next part um, of, our, of um, our webinar series. Uh, ben Murray, he's a senior researcher at Food and Water Watch, uh, where he specializes in water issues, um, as well as the intersection of water and energy. Uh, he received his master's degree in agricultural and environmental economics um, from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And now he lives in Nashville, Tennessee, where he enjoys the music scene locally uh, and being close to family. And we're really happy to have you here with us, Ben. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. That was a great presentation, Jessica. Um, hopefully mine uh, is as informative. So, uh, yeah, as we've been talking about today, the water and energy connection is, you know, is really important across the whole country and from community to community. Um, so I'm going to be talking about it kind of from a more um, not scientific point of view, but kind of uh, basically a broad explainer of where water comes into play in terms of our energy systems and obviously um, the impacts that on people's lives and like the the unproportionate impact that people face from energy burdens or water scarcity um, is really important, but I'm going to kind of focus on the on a big level of where water fits into our energy system and um, hopefully this kind of like paints a good picture of what we need to know going forward in terms of a clean a clean energy future um, and compared to what you know industry and unfortunately some politicians are pitching as a clean energy future so hopefully we can kind of like understand what's real and what's not. So <clears throat> the first thing I'm going to say for some perspective here is um, that in 2015, um, thermal power thermal power plant cooling accounted for 40% of all energy withdrawal um, in the US. So that's a lot of energy. So this is energy drawn from rivers and lakes and other uh, sources. Um, obviously, agriculture is a big one, but thermal cooling for power plants is a huge um, a huge user of water in our current system. That's often because of the still running coal plants and now recently kind of like rejuvenated natural gas world. Um, so on top of the cooling, um, upstream water consumption accounts for 30% of total water consumption of coal fired electricity. So you could think of mining activities, shipping uh, coal uh, across rivers and across the country. Um, and as I mentioned, the rejuvenated natural gas um, industry, fracking has helped increase the upstream water consumption for natural gas from 11% of total natural gas water consumption 
to, in 2013 to 19% in 2016. So that means that fracking, the 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 adoption of fracking actually has made uh, has made natural gas production more water intensive in uh, between 2013 and 2016. And um, as fracking increases, that trend is going to increase as well. And not surprisingly. This is not the case for renewable energy. So solar and wind energy, kind of two of the main um, renewable energies that us, we at Food and Water Watch are proponents of, use a fraction of a fraction of the water that nuclear and uh, fossil fuel generated energy um, uses. So these charts are kind of helpful, but solar and wind use so, so little water that it's actually kind of hard to see what's going on here. But on the left, we have water consumption, which means how much water is taken in um, from a nuclear plant or a coal plant or a solar field. And um, it is kind of used up in evaporation or used uh, and not, not sent back into the, to the ecosystem it was taken from. And you can just see from both of these uh, charts that the water needed for nuclear coal and natural gas is much larger than the water needed for solar and wind. The, 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 the bars for solar and wind are there but they're just so small compared to the other energy types that um, you can't really see them. Um, so this is a big port because renewable energy is a much less thirsty uh, energy sources than coal, nuclear, and natural gas. Um, we did some calculations at Food and Water Watch and we found that if given a shift to a fully renewable energy generation mix, the U.S. could see a 99% decrease in both water consumption and withdrawals from levels currently used by fossil fuels and nuclear energy sources. So um, a lot of politicians have outlined a, a kind of a path to uh, a renewable energy future. And if we actually did this fully renewable energy we would decrease our water use as a country in terms of energy water use by 99%. Um, that frees up a lot of water um, in areas under high water stress out west, as well as areas um, like Flint or Jackson, Mississippi, or areas in Pennsylvania and Ohio and other kind of fracking heavy areas where water or communities are experiencing water quality issues because of nearby um, natural gas production fracking. And this is really important because nationally over two thirds of water consumed in electric electrical generation comes from freshwater sources. So this isn't th these aren't kind of plants that are drawing from the ocean. That that does happen, but the majority of the water being used in these cooling systems is actually freshwater sources that could obviously go to a lot better uh, and kind of more life giving uh, uses, um, whether it's communities or using the water in their homes or agriculture. Um, so on top of the kind of dichotomy between uh, renewable energy and fossil fuels and their kind of inequitable use of water, there are some false solutions that we at Food and Water Watch like to point out um, that, you know, some environmental organizations, uh, if they're unfortunately maybe in the uh, working with some industry people, might say and promote as these water saving and environmentally friendly um, new technologies, but sometimes they're kind of a cover for uh, industry handouts and uh, kind of, you know, tax dollars going to companies that want to keep fossil fuels and these kind of these thirstier energy, uh, these energy um, sources alive. So two of these are CCS and hydrogen. So CCS stands for carbon capture and storage. You may have heard of this. Um, and then hydrogen is hydrogen energy, which we've been hearing about kind of as this magical uh, clean energy future that has yet to come, but is actually currently in the works under the uh, Biden, the Biden administration. So there are billions in public subsidies for both CCS and hydrogen. These public subsidies are often going to kind of the top energy producers, whether it's ExxonMobil or Chevron. Um, they often partner with companies to do carbon capture and storage or hydrogen production. Um, and this is kind of part of what we call dirty energy greenwashing. You've probably heard about greenwashing in a lot of different, or there's a lot of different types of washing. Uh, and greenwashing is the one that we deal with the most at Food, Net, Food and Water Watch because a lot of these companies, these fossil fuel companies, you know, gas companies, oil companies, they see that the writing's on the wall when it comes to an energy transition and they're trying to get as much energy, they're trying to get as much money out of it as possible while still maintaining 
uh, fossil fuel infrastructure that unfortunately the US is very reliant on right now. And the third point here is getting ahead of the law, which means that these companies that are trying to keep fossil fuels, the main or, or fossil fuels or fossil fuel infrastructure as the main uh, kind of energy source, um, getting ahead of the law means writing these laws for CCS and hydrogen build out that are industry friendly. Um, and that often comes uh, that often comes at the expense of frontline communities, whether they are citing eminent domain to build a pipeline through farmers' fields in Iowa or opening uh, repurposing coal plants um, in Philadelphia or other places. There's th these companies are kind of jumping on these new government programs to make sure that the fossil fuel infrastructure stays entrenched and important. So it's important to that we know that sometimes these things that are called clean energy solutions by the government or by industry are not actually what they claim to be. So uh, I'm going to speed up and get through these two. So hydrogen is one of the most abundant elements on Earth, but it's rarely found on its own. So hydrogen has been marketed as a clean fuel source that only produces heat and water as a byproduct. So you need to take a source of energy, whether it's from coal or natural gas or a renewable source, and using that energy, you can then create hydrogen, which can fuel a fuel cell vehicle or some other battery. Um, currently, the most common uses for hydrogen are industrial processing, such as oil refinery and fertilizer production. Um, other uses include energy production through fuel cells, like vehicles, as I mentioned, or burning for electric generation uh, and as an alternative fuel for vehicles. So hydrogen actually is in current state is often mixed with natural gas to produce electricity. So between that and it's oil refining. Hydrogen is a, is a big way for companies that are in the fossil fuel industry to say, we're using this clean energy, but what it's really being used to do is maintain reliance on fossil fuels, whether it's through natural gas or oil refinery. Um, also, hydrogen has some chemical and kind of just scientific drawbacks. So hydrogen burned for electricity generation actually produces six times more nitrous oxide than natural gas, which is a harmful pollutant that causes asthma and other health effects. Um, and hydrogen has over 33 times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide over a 20 year period. So kind of its effect on the ozone. Um, these, these, are, these, these issues can be dealt with, but they're often looked over um, and not really cited as issues, even though they have serious issues to communities that are around hydrogen producing plants or houses that end up using a hydrogen and, and natural gas mix. There are a few types of hydrogen, as I mentioned earlier. Black or brown hydrogen is hydrogen that is uh, create, uh, produced using coal, obviously not a very clean energy source. Gray hydrogen is hydrogen produced using natural gas. Blue hydrogen is a hydrogen produced using natural gas and then using carbon capture and storage to deal with these emissions and the carbon pollution that comes from natural gas. I'll talk briefly about carbon capture and storage at the end of this because it's another water issue. These are all, I'll tie these into the water issue shortly. And then green hydrogen is hydrogen produced using renewable energy. Um, so hydrogen, one of the main issues with it is, is water usage. Similar to fossil fuels, the production of hydrogen is very water intensive, needing water for cooling, uh, raw water treatment, water disposal, and upstream water uses. Um, the upstream water uses are pretty intense, especially for hydrogen that's produced using coal or natural gas, as coal and natural gas require mining and processing. Um, and hydrogen uh, needs water, you need a lot of clean water to produce hydrogen. So there's a lot of uh, concerns being raised right now about a national hydrogen rollout because they're opening hydrogen in Texas and California. And these are areas that are experiencing high water stress. Um, so it's important to uh, deal uh, uh, deal with this when rolling out a new a new energy um, a new type of energy. Uh, I'm going to skip those in the interest of time. So the Department of Energy is rolling out a hydrogen plan uh, that they actually recently kind of decided on seven hubs that they're going to fund. Um, as of 2020, the U.S. produced 10 million megatons of hydrogen. And 95% of this was produced using natural gas, 4% produced using coal, and just 1% was produced using renewable energy. So clearly here, hydrogen is very reliant 
on us maintaining fossil fuel infrastructure, whether it's through natural gas pipelines or coal. Um, the Department of Energy projects that by 2050, hydrogen production will optimistically be two thirds coming from renewable sources with the other third coming from natural gas. Um, unfortunately, that's not, that plan isn't, they're not sticking to that plan even yet. Um, of the seven hydrogen, federal hydrogen uh, hubs that they've funded, four of them are gonna be natural gas and the other three are renewables. So already a majority of the federally funded hydrogen plants are still relying on natural gas. And hydrogen on top of natural gas is a very water intensive process. Um, so the department, as I mentioned, the Department of Energy announced seven hydrogen hubs receiving $7 billion in federal funds to produce hydrogen with a large portion coming from blue hydrogen, which is natural gas. Um, these industry partners for these plans include Chevron, ExxonMobil, Shell Company, uh, you can imagine the usual suspects. Um, and similarly, the end uses include industrial feedstocks, power generation, hydrogen blending and natural gas, and ammonia plants for fertilizer production. So hydrogen doesn't really, is not really this transition to clean energy that we hope it to be. And it's also a very water intensive, uh, very water intensive energy source. Um, to, to illustrate how water intensive it is, we estimated that the Department of Energy's, we being Food and Water Watch estimated that the Department of Energy's goal of 50 million megatons of hydrogen in 2015 would require 1 trillion gallons of fresh water uh, or 4.6 trillion gallons of seawater. But that 1 trillion gallons of fresh water is equivalent to over 34 million Americans' annual home water use. So that's nearly 10% of the country. So this is a very water intensive um, energy source that the current plans do not have not really addressed. And there's a lot of areas that would really suffer from diverting fresh water uh, resources to a hydrogen rollout, especially if that hydrogen rollout is still uh, reliant on fossil fuel infrastructure and fossil fuels themselves. And really quickly, I'll talk about the last kind of false solution here that deals with implications of uh, water is uh, carbon capture and storage or CCS. So carbon capture and storage proposes to capture carbon from um, smokestacks, you know, at the plant level or from the atmosphere, then compress, transport, and inject the carbon either to extract more oil in the ground or store the carbon un in underground reservoirs. Um, this may sound like a perfect kind of fairy tale uh, a solution to our problems, and that's because it is exactly that. What CCS really is, is a handout to fossil fuel companies to still rely on fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, not surprisingly, carbon capture and storage actually increases demand for fossil fuels, given it has an energy pen penalty of 13 to 44%. What that means is to produce one megawatt of energy, electricity, uh, if you're using CCS, it may decrease carbon pollution, but it actually requires more fossil fuels to produce that one unit of energy because of the kind of because of the demands that CCS machinery has on the process. So it doesn't only entrench fossil fuel usage, it actually increases the demand for fossil fuels um, given this energy penalty. And on top of that, long-term stable storage of carbon in the ground remains largely unproven. Um, it's There's not really any proof that we can store carbon underground um, in a long-term way. And unsurprisingly, CCS requires water use at more water use at almost all steps of the of energy production. Um, it's a very both energy and water intensive technology. Um, CCS grew out of the Clean Coal Initiative of the 1980s, and uh, under the George W. Bush administration, it, it gained even more funding. And despite the billions of dollars to fund this research, um, there remains broad consensus that CCS is too expensive for widespread deployment. Um, that means that these CCS projects are dependent on very extravagant tax credits that are often misused. As I mentioned earlier, um, kind of it's a handout to industry and a 2020 department, Treasury Department Inspector General investigation found this out the hard way. Um, so a tax credit called 45Q, a uh, billion dollars of these tax credits were handed out and almost $900 million, so 90, nearly 90% 90 of these tax credits were decidedly improperly claimed. So claimed for not real 
uh, decreases in, in carbon pollution. And ten, the 10 companies claimed 99% of these total credits. So, you know, as I mentioned, the, us the usual suspects of large fossil fuel companies really jumped on these, uh, jumped on this wagon. Um, and this is really a big problem. Obviously, I'm not talking, I'm not, I, I, this hasn't been a very personal presentation on my end because I'm not really talking about the effects on communities. But I think it's really important to understand that these solutions that the industry is pitching to us are not serious solutions that are going to address the foundation all issues of energy and water. And these are kind of often kind of masquerade as false solutions that are end up just being hand out of millions, if not billions of dollars of taxes to large companies that their main goal is to keep us reliant on fossil fuel infrastructure, which is a thirstier, um, more water intensive energy source than renewable energy uh, sources. And that does, those, those have real effects on communities and uh, our water use going forward. Um, I think I'm a little over time, so I'm going to leave it there, and hopefully I can answer some questions if people have them during the Q&A portion. Thank you so much, Ben. That was very informative, um, especially because we often hear about this false solutions, like you mentioned, and they're at like the hot topic of conversation sometimes in some energy spaces. Um, but as we know, not because it sounds innovative necessarily, it's a real solution, and so it's important to be uh, critical and and get the the right information and it was um it was very interesting to learn that you know 99 percent uh of of water that is used for energy could be saved if we switch yeah. to solar and wind so that's that's a huge amount and i know um you know coming from the permian basin the community of el paso texas where, where we they started a lot of fracking recently and we have had water stress for decades and and a lot of concerns for our future and and certainly you know how we're how we're protecting our communities from there. What you know, what are the narratives that we're that we're pushing out to to build community and um, resist some of this this push out that we see it in the latest increase in natural um, gas and, and fossil fuels. So very um, interesting presentations on both ends. Thank you, Jessica and and Ben. And I'm sure a lot of people have questions. I have a lot of questions too, but I'll let um. Some of our uh, some people in our audience present. Um, I saw a question for uh, you, Ben, earlier um, on the chat um, that said if you could explain the difference between water consumption and water withdrawal. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I realized during that slide that I should have done had a slide to say that. So water consumption is water that is taken into a power plant, let's say, to cool the plant, and then is evaporated up during that process. So it's not returned to, let's say, the river that it's taken from. Um, so the consumption is water that is taken from an ecosystem and not discharged back into it. Whereas water withdrawal is just the water that's taken and then withdrawn back into the river. So if you take, let's say, 50 gallons of water from a river to cool a, a, a plant, let's say 10 gallons of it is evaporated. So 10 gallons of it is consumed and the other 40 gallons is discharged back into the river. So the withdrawal would be 50 because it's the total withdrawn, but only 10 gallons is consumed because 40, 40 gallons is withdrawn back. And that has its own issues because water that is, you can imagine water that's used for a cooling process is discharged at a higher temperature. And so there's a thing called thermal pollution that causes a lot of issues for uh, aquatic ecosystems. Um, my family is from the Ohio River uh, valley. And so a lot of coal plants were there and they've actually since closed, but we'd go out on the river and the water would be very warm close to the power plant, which maybe I shouldn't have been in that water in the first place, but that's just how it goes, you know. <laughs> Thank you for, for that explanation and, and also, you know, giving insights into the withdrawal with, with parentheses there and more of a disclaimer of what the Given back to the to the water source really means. Yeah. Um, Jessica, um, I also saw um, you had a graph with some of the conversations on the public discourse on climate and water and how that had been increasing over the years. Um, I saw different colors for um, the graph, and I wanted to see if you had any insights of what each of the circles meant and how that was growing. Um, especially the water and climate one, if you could identify it, just which colors it was so that we can follow perhaps. Um... 
So um, <clears throat> thank you. So this is more about um, what level of concern folks are ranking at based on like climate concern and how it's growing. So Yale Climate Communications developed a really rigorous set of criteria of like dismissive, disengaged, you know, concerned, et cetera, to actually help inform climate communicators like what um, demographics to focus their efforts on. So for example, folks that are completely disengaged or more like dismissive, there's people who are reachable and people who are more like less reachable, <laughs> let's just say. And so what they found over this time is that Interestingly and hopefully, we've actually seen more folks move into the category of being concerned or cautious and that gap between partisanship actually closing. So right in the in the past, we had we still do have climate denial, but the data that Yale was finding is that there's actually a lot of folks that are joining the camp of being concerned or cautious around climate. So that's a positive thing and can help inform our communications. I'll do my best to find their landing page and the resource because it is really interesting and goes in depth quite a bit. Thank you so much for, for that explanation. And and I think for um, a lot of us, as, as you already mentioned, perhaps um, perhaps the issues that are in our mind are not every day is, is the energy issue, but I feel like water is definitely one that is a lot more prevalent um, in our in our minds in our concerns and especially after this summer um, I think it was in everyone's mind especially you know how hot it was uh, hitting record high temperatures that we hadn't experienced one of the hottest or the hottest um, summers that we had experienced so far and so um, certainly it's important to have it as an entry point um, into you know into the systems and, and into plugging people for working in, in climate justice or mobilizing. Um, I invite people to continue writing uh, on the chat their questions, or also if they want to um, unmute and ask their questions, they may also um, do so as well. I see another questions in the chat um, uh, from Thelma. She says, um, are all states conductive to solar or wind energy? She gives an example from California that has windmills uh, in Palm Springs uh, in parts of Northern California. Yeah, I'm not sure if that question is for me, but I can answer. I can answer it. Um, yeah, not all places are are uh, conducive for either when. Ben is on mute. Oh, am I still on mute? I hear you. Okay. Uh, I don't think not. Not all places are con are conducive to um, wind and solar, but I think one of the issues we see right now is because fossil fuel has because fossil fuels have been used ac ac across the country, the existence of fossil fuel infrastructure is being cited as a reason to keep relying on these fossil fuel infrastructures, whether it's pipelines or old coal plants that are being repurposed as hydrogen or natural gas plants. And so um, it's important to kind of highlight the or study and figure out what areas are conducive to wind and solar. Um, but not fall back and say, well, we have these existing fossil fuel infrastructure plants and power and pipelines here already. So let's just use those. Um, but the answer is no, not all places are conducive to wind and solar, but uh, there's still there's still enough wind and solar across the country to make that transition and not rely on the fossil fuel infrastructure that is that's there. Definitely. Um, I keep bringing in Texas up because it's where I know, but not because we have a lot, but it doesn't mean, you know, um, we have a lot of sun too. We could definitely make a yeah. big transition and, you know, change our whole energy system there if, if there's a political will. Um, I'll take a couple more questions from the chat um, and then I see your hand being raised, Stephanie. Um, so the next question is for Jessica. Who or what parties uh, does your organization tell stories to influence change? So who are your your target audiences, Jessica. Me, because I think um, my my connection's pretty weak. Can you hear me? Yes, we okay. hear you well. Perfect. Yeah, I'm just going to stay off screen since it's a little cut and uh, touch and go. Sorry about that. So, um, good question. 
So since we are um, a field service organization, it depends on the campaign and the partner. So I'll give you a couple examples. Um, something that I worked on personally when I came on was a fight against the Line 3 oil pipeline because you know it had big water impacts in addition to obviously emissions. Now the, the audience for that was a little bit more public because we were um, helping on, we were working with Honor the Earth, an indigenous led org, and they were really trying to reach the public and sway the Biden administration to pull the plug on this really awful project. So in that case, you know, I worked with like some Gen Z influencers and celebs to push out messaging and content to have people understand what was going around and what was at stake. So that's one example we worked on. In that context, it was more of a wider public audience and a younger audience. However, um, we have other partners, for example, that are distributed across the United States, but are fighting for policy change and around water affordability, for example, right now. So sometimes it's policymakers that we're talking to. And, you know, the messaging and the content looks different depending on who that is. So um, just wanted to provide a couple examples. Like, it really depends on the project. Um, and we just try to tailor our messages and our strategy accordingly. Certainly. Thank you, Jessica. Um, and we love to see those multi-generational efforts and campaigns sometimes. And you, before you mentioned um, the inclusion of of art and culture into our advocacy and how it, it's so important that we're not just throwing facts into people's heads, but that we're reaching them, you know, in the hearts. So the power of storytelling, telling our own stories. And, you know, in the years that I've had organizing with United Women in Faith, um, coming from, you know, people from all over the States. And so we know we have all sorts of story to share. And a lot of times it's our own personal story um, in these communities that we live. So, so important um, that we use those tools and um, speak truthfully and also thinking about who our audience is and what values do they have and how can we um, tackle those um, so that we can yeah, influence mm -hmm. policymakers or others to join us. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add one more thing where something that we've been trying to do more of too. So for example, the Biden administration, um, you know, we under his administration, we now have something called the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act something that we did to educate folks around the benefits coming to communities again was working with with content creators online and something that we've been trying to do more speaking of people who telling their own stories is partnering with folks who are part of these impacted communities so for example um, we partnered with an indigenous influencer who has a large reach to talk about the benefits to native communities coming in terms of like water access, new water system in, investments and whatnot. So yeah, I agree with you. Thank you for, for that insight. I see another question uh, on the chat. Uh, and this is gonna be a big question. So whoever wants to speak to that, uh, how do we efficiently and cost effectively move away from fossil fuels towards renewable energy? I can take a stab at that question. Uh, I don't know if, if cost effectively is something that I don't know if I can speak to because uh, I don't think, well, we, uh, Food and Water Watch has a report out about kind of the demand side of, of the, or yeah, the supply side of a, a, an energy transition. And the point of the report is saying that we have the ability to transition with physical means from a fossil fuel infrastructure to renewables. The cost effective part is tough because um, I think industry often points to costs of transitioning from, a, from our kind of dirty fuel infrastructure are high. But I think the point is that that transition is worth it. Um, and if we, get too, if we get too bogged down by the bottom line, we'll never make that tr transition. Um, it's gonna always gonna, it may, it may always be easier to, keep an up running coal plant, but research is coming out now that, you know, renewables are becoming more or becoming more affordable than, than gas, than gas in a lot of areas. And kind of the, I think the best way to 
to, to make this transition, especially if we're worried about the bottom, bottom line, is end uh, subsidies for oil, end subsidies for natural gas. And these kind of the subsidies, um, whether they're you know, kind of disguised through CCS or disguised through hydrogen. Um, these subsidies are are what's keeping the fossil fuel industry afloat. You know, the fossil fuel industry is scrambling to claim up these tax credits, which I said they got nearly a billion dollars worth of in the last two years or since 2020. Um, it's these public, it's our, it's our tax dollars that are keeping this dirty infrastructure afloat. Um, and so the first step would be to stop these subsidies. Um, and then I think the second step would be the classic thing that we'd all love to see, but is get these industry interests out of the out of the kind of the the floor when they're making these rules. Um, you know, the the lobbyists from Chevron or Shell or whoever it is, they're they have a huge say in how these tax credits are rolled out, how they're designed. Um, and so, as long as these people have a have an unproportionate voice in the conversation. Then it's always going to. It's always they're always going to. These are for-profit companies, so they're all their bottom line is the number one thing. So I think the first step is to end subsidies for fossil fuels and kind of get the corporate interests out of our out of our energy uh, out of our energy tax credits or our energy plan as a country, which unfortunately the Biden administration has not really done. Um, these these the hydrogen rollout that I've been talking about is. You know, is littered with industry interests and littered littered with tax subsidies for fossil fuel companies. Thank you. Very important not to forget the subsidies that we got to that we get to fossil fuels to make them affordable, um, but not really something we can afford um, anymore or in the long run. Uh, Jessica, do you want to add um, anything on that? Um, um, I mean, Ben, you did such a good job encapsulating it. All I'll say is that, you know, while it's not a panacea, the Inflation Reduction Act that I mentioned earlier um, is the largest investment in climate response ever, really. And so there's quite a bit of funding in there, billions of dollars um, dedicated to help with a just transition. However, we know that the investment needs are so high, like you said, Ben, and it's worth the money. What we've been saying about this opportunity, which is truly like once in a generation, is that it's just a down payment. We need a lot more investment. It's not enough. But right now, this is um, kind of like a Kickstarter to try to get those off the ground. Of course, unfortunately, there were concessions made um, because of um, Joe Manchin where there's some trade-offs, unfortunately, um, that we're sad to see uh, in terms of, you know, um, you know, him trying to sneak in some pro-fossil fuel uh, trade-offs in the legislation. However, yes, there's, that's a, that's the biggest window right now, but we also need a shift in sentiment and prioritization um, to really make this work and go to scale. Thank you, Jessica. And I think you also touched on a very important point that we cannot, um, you know, um, promote renewables while compromising uh, some of these fossil fuel uh, projects that sometimes have been tied uh, to this investment in fossil fuels, such as Inflation Reduction Act and connected uh, through mentioned through the Willow Project um, and, you know, more, um, yeah, fossil fuel permitting legislation. Uh, we need to make sure um, that, you know, we, we're not doing one, we'll continue to do the other, but really make a transition out of fossil fuels um, and, and stop the proliferation uh, of it. And just a fact that I had um, in mind um, uh, from, from last week's presentation uh, somewhere else, solar is actually uh, came down in the last 10 years. Uh, the price of solar has reduced by 85%. So it's actually one of the most affordable um, forms of energy sources right now. And that was the same for all of the of the renewable energy so source, offshore, wind, and um, onshore meal as well. Like the prices of this has considerably reduced. And so they're a lot more affordable um, than sometimes the industries, uh, the energy industries wants us to know, uh, but the possibilities are out there. And so definitely a transition. And sometimes what had kept perhaps uh, us out of the transition is that we locked in the fossil fuel industry. Um, and that's, you know, where some of the transition cons 
co costs come from. They come from not transitioning earlier. Um, and so it's really, um, it's really way over time that they that we make this this investments um and they're really more cost efficient now um and and certainly i mean beyond even the cost uh selling point um just what the emergency of the climate crisis requires and also um the health of our communities through all this air pollution that they're causing um, Keisha, do you see any other uh, questions on the chat? Um, I know Ms. Stephanie had her hand raised earlier. I uh, would like to see if you would to um, unmute yourself or share your question in the chat. Yes, I'm I'm here. Um, I, it was too much to type and, I, and my thoughts are rambling. So I thought I would just talk out loud and maybe you could help me untangle what it is I'm trying to get to. Um, so Jessica, thank you both for your presentations and always... Uh, these things are always very informative and gives us more to think about. But Jessica, you started out talking about communicating and telling telling our stories, and so you're a commun communicator on on you know grant on a large scale. Um, and so this is this question is for Jessica Ben or Ilka. Um, the term so there's there there's always seems to be a big gap between you know the technical aspects and the term terminology that you all used and so we're you're you you know it and you're talking about it but we have to translate it into our own language and our own words so Jessica you were talking about the importance of storytelling so I think this is my question um uh Ilka if our the United Women of Faith do we have a a a, a lexicon or a glossary that's a cheat sheet uh, that's being generated and easily updated for us to use. And then is there something as practical as a writing prompt or something where we could actually practice writing our stories and formulating it and and practice the, you know, our speech, a three minute speech or an elevator speech or five minute speech about this issue? Because um, we're talking about mobilizing for political reasons, but also just awareness. And as you said, it starts with our own experiences and where we are. And while I appreciated, you know, all the information, the data, um, you also started, we also mentioned somewhere about making it personal. And so it has to start there for the layperson or the advocate or uh, people who are involved because of our passion or our experiences and, and concerns. So so did you understand what I'm saying? So practical practical ways for us to understand the terminology and formulate our one minute, three minute, five minute speech, whatever. It's a really good question. I can start if it's helpful. Um, something that we do at the Water Hub actually is offer free training for folks on communications and digital, um, you know, pertaining to water and how to reach folks. Uh, something that we actually did that I'm going to drop in the chat, we do have a recording to the training, but also a blog that's really simple to read, is called um, Water Words That Connect. So I know I used a lot of jargon. I was talking about PFAS. I was talking about all this stuff, but really, what does it mean and how can we break it down? Uh, something that, you know, I'm, I've got two screens here, so bear with me. So, you know, we just to go through some of these quick tips and then I'll drop the link in the chat. Um, number one is I, I, I am, I'm, a, I violate this myself, but keeping things simple, right? Avoiding acronyms, insider lingo jargon. The reason why, you know, my presentation definitely was a little bit more insider baseball, but if you're looking to reach people or develop your own stories, definitely keep it simple. So instead of say something like drinking water instead of potable water, right? Like thinking about what you can swap out to make connect with people. Because like you said, when you're throwing a bunch of data and facts at people, um, you know, it doesn't reach them in their heart, which is actually what moves people to action than trying to, con like, yes, data and facts are important, but sometimes what people connect to more is like storytelling, heart-centered communications and less about these heady facts. So that's an example. Um, another tip was, you know, using um, sometimes more words, sometimes like 
So instead of relying on shorthand, we can use more words. So for example, instead of talking about nutrient pollution, <laughs> saying something that's more clear, like fertilizer and manure from farms that's washing into our rivers and creating toxic algae, like thinking about how to tell stories without getting too over, abbrevi over abbreviated and, you know, being specific really helps. Um, painting a picture and tapping into memory to humanize the topic, get personal, tap into people's values. For example, instead of just saying, talking about climate change, reference changes in weather that impact your audience, like st stronger storms that are flooding homes. That's really helpful to reach people and to localize these stories. Like you said, like talk about your community, what's happening to your family, families around you that can get people to care. So I'm gonna drop this in the chat. There's some tips on things that we can swap out in terms of jargon. I'll also drop a link to our YouTube channel where we host um, our trainings. And if anyone is welcome to join, I'll also drop a link to our newsletter. If you join our newsletter, you'll hear about our trainings that are pretty much bi-monthly. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. And um, I think, Stephanie, if you are okay with it, maybe we can reconnect offline yeah, and yeah. form something that we can, you know, use this um, resources that Jessica is sharing to create something that we can adapt as well for our audience um, to communicate better. Um, and kind of like, you know, in, in our advocacy and how we're doing, uh, you said you want to make it personal. And there was a question there in the chat that said, you know, is the electricity that I'm using in my home, is it, is it increasing natural gas use? Well, obviously it depends where your electricity locally or in your community is coming from. Um, certainly we all want to do our part in conserving energy because energy not spent, that's the cheapest form of energy. If <laughs> You don't have to pay uh, if you're not producing energy. But if we're all doing our parts, but we, what we really are looking for is systemic change, right? So when we talk to legislators, we want to tell them, hey, I'm trying to save energy in my home, but I really need you to help me because uh, I can't do it alone, you know, and um, speak from your hearts um, and, and take action. Thank you both, Ben and Jessica, for those amazing, great presentations. We're so thankful to have you. Yeah, I also um, want to shout out, uh, there's another Stephanie in the chat who asked about transmission stations for solar and wind. And that's a really important thing. Um, like the rural electrification, not to get too boring right now, but the Rural Electrification Act from the Tennessee Valley Authority following World War II was kind of the main electrification of the country. And that obviously was coming from very dirty energy sources back in the 40s and 50s. Um, and so, yes, our transmission system is very, very out of date. And if we do want to do, if we do want this transition to a renewable energy future, it needs to totally rethink the transmission system because we don't want to refla rely on natural gas and coal reserves like the original transmission system did. We want to rely on a new renewable energy transmission system. Um, so I won't go any further there, but that's a great question from uh, another Stephanie in the chat. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for jumping in. Is there any other questions I might have missed? Okay. If there's no more questions, then I'll thank again uh, Ben and Jessica for their great insights uh, and presentations. Um, and we'll move us into some uh, um, opportunities for action. Uh, Jessica shared in the chat some resources. I don't know if Ben, you also had some resources or Jessica, if you had additional resources that our members can take action on. If you have any initiatives uh, or things that you're working in, please uh, feel free to write them in the chat. Um, and we'll direct uh, people and, and share them af also after this webinar so people can continue to engage. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll just share some uh, quick action alerts as well from, from our end. Um, we, as you know, United Women in Faith has action alerts um, that go out um, on a regular basis for this year. Uh, we have focus on um, an energy uh, in climate justice um, uh, campaign. Uh, and we this is a multi-action petition, which means actually you can fill it in multiple times and monthly remind uh, your elected officials to pri prioritize climate justice legislation. And this petition includes different parts, uh, different forms of legislation um, and is uh, directed to Congress um, 
And it has a number of legislative pieces, including a demand for a sustainable and improved farm bill, um, among others. So again, making these connections across systems uh, in this water, energy, climate, food production net, um, nexus that it's so important um, to emphasize. And so I will invite you all to take a minute um, uh, to click on the link on the chat. It takes a minute or two to write your information and you'll be sending um, a reminder, a message uh, to your elected official, to Congress, uh, to prioritize climate justice legislation, because we want a transition into renewable energy. But as it was said before, we don't want to perpetuate the issues of the fossil fuel system and the fossil fuel era. Uh, we want to make sure that this renewable energies and um, new energy system is, is truly just and equitable for our communities. And so I'll invite you all to click um, on that link uh, and then continue engaging with our with our climate justice actions. Uh, we have a page also where you can find all of our active um, action alerts and you can share this with friends and families and click on them anytime. Um, I like to save you know, the contact information of our elected officials handy or as favorites in our phones and our emails so we can message them monthly and let them know, you know that climate justice is a concern of people of faith, of women of faith. Um, so I'll invite you to continually um, check out that page also in the chat um, and fill out uh, our multiple climate actions. And don't forget to fill out our evaluation too as well. <laughs> Thank you. you any... Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your evening. Bye now. Bye-bye. <laughs>